Okay. Welcome to Companion Planting and Design presented by Kate Donovan with Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens and Stores Library. My name is Lindsay and I'm a library assistant uh, for the Adult Services Department at Stores. Thank you to the Friends of Stores Library for sponsoring this program tonight. Um, and just a little program description, the Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens is here with us tonight to discuss companion planting and design. Some plants just naturally grow better next to others and well, some don't. Learn from Blackstone Valley Ve Veggie Gardens about what keeps the peace in your garden. The mission at Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens is to inspire others to grow their own fresh produce. They deliver residential and community-based training, consulting, and assistance in vegetable garden development, and are dedicated to the belief that most people should have the knowledge and opportunity to grow wholesome fruits and veggies. So Kate, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, everybody. I wanna share my presentation here. Uh, let's see. I do want you to know you picked a good one, um, especially, you know, with what's all the stuff that's going on, you know, certainly um, prices of everything going up and up and up. And it's really good to be able to get some good sustainable skills and start growing your own food. I do want you to know that, uh, you know, as I say before the before COVID, we used to actually be in a room together. So I would hand around a sign up sheet. And if you wanted uh, the presentation, we would have hard copies there. Or if you wanted to, me to email it, you would sign a, a, a list. We don't have a list here. So please contact me if you want uh, the PowerPoint uh, presentation. If, and, and obviously you're going to get uh, the recording from Lindsay. However, the recording, this, I always do a very how-to. There's a lot of charts in here, a lot of information. Uh, that you may not want to listen to a recording for an hour. So in any case, please feel free to contact me. My name is Kate Donovan. This is my email, bvveggiegardens at gmail.com. And you can also contact me via my website. There's a contact us link. Also on that website, you'll see all our events. We have several events throughout New England. And um, the, the, uh, a lot of them are Zoom. And uh, you're, you're more than welcome to, to you know, to, uh, 10, 15 a month, all different kinds. There's 21 uh, presentations in the portfolio. I do 19 of them. And Eric, the gentleman who works on my team, um, has a couple also. So you, you, so peruse through, you'll see we have a lot of YouTube videos, our link, YouTube channels linked there and uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, photos of stuff we've done. So in any case, feel free to contact me via my email or via the contact us form on my website. Companion planning and design. Okay, in this presentation, we're gonna review how to incorporate your perennials and reseeders. We're gonna look at the zone 6A growing schedule. You folks in Long Meadow might be zone 5B, which is almost exactly the same. So you could use this schedule as, or you could just do a Google search for 5B. Um, because I, but in, in any case, it's the same, it, it's fine. We'll learn how to maximize our yields because it's important. I, I literally harvest from my garden nine to 10 months out of the year. We'll learn about a couple of gardening techniques. You know, we're talking about planning and your garden. So we'll, we'll look at the Square foot gardening. We'll look at the three sisters gardening uh, system that used to be done way back uh, by our Native Americans that lived right here and where I am in Blackstone, the, the Nipmuc. Um, we'll, we'll integrate herbs. Herbs are pretty cool. You know, I was just talking to Lindsay, they certainly make your food taste better. They also help in the garden. They have a positive effect when, when grown with certain vegetables. Not only that, but they deter pests as well. We'll do. We'll look at some tools that I use for garden planting. We do have a slide on which plants are compatible and incompatible with other plants, and we'll do a Q and A at the end. Okay. So when you're planting your garden, 
just remember you've got perennials out there. You know, you've got an asparagus bed. That's going to come up every spring. It's a very early spring crop. Asparagus is a lovely perennial. comes in three colors that I know of, purple, white, and green. And a good asparagus patch is going to outlive, certainly outlive me because they last for 40 years if they're, if they're treated correctly. So, so uh, your asparagus patch, it doesn't, it, it's very hardy and it, like I say, it's, it's persistent. It comes up every year. However, it doesn't, it's not invasive. It doesn't spread around. Also, and you got to make room for it. You know, when you're cleaning up your garden in the fall or what have you, you have to remember that's where my asparagus uh, patch is. And, you know, understanding that it doesn't spread too quickly. So strawberries, you know, there are some strawberries. Understand that some come up in June and they come up maybe the end of May and they're gone by mid-July, certainly. And others bear through the summer. Typically the larger uh, the larger berries that come up are the June berry, are June bearing. And the ones that come up through the summer are basically they call them ever bearing. Um, but understand how they how they propagate and they and they can spread. Uh, they don't spread under the ground like a mint or an invasive uh, herb, but they do spread through runners. You know, the runners shoot out of the middle of the plant and wherever the runner lies, a new strawberry plant will develop. So be aware that your strawberry plant could grow and allocate enough space for it. And if it starts getting piggish and taking over too much space, understand you can dig them up and plant them somewhere else. So you're in charge of your garden space. And these perennials can really throw a, a monkey in the wrench or whatever the expression is. So you have to get on top of them before they, before they, they literally take over. Jerusalem artichokes. I actually talked about this in the last class I was doing. Jerusalem artichokes, AKA sunchokes, are the most reliable food source that's a Native American plant. They grow 10 to 12 feet uh, tall and they grow a pretty little sunflower, not huge considering the height, uh, but they produce an edible tuber that looks just like ginger, tastes nothing like ginger. It tastes like a cross between a potato and a uh, water chestnut, nice and crunchy. You can put it in a slaw, you can roast it, you can uh, put it in a stew or use it just like you'd use a potato. Um, nutty nutty flavor but the the so and they're very reliable but there's a very fine line between a reliable crop and an invasive crop so understand that if you put jerusalem artichokes in uh your your garden and you expect to have room for tomatoes you have to understand that when you plant them and you have to put you know barriers in and and you have to understand what you're doing or they or they'll take over so allocate enough room for your perennials and make sure they stay in their space. You got to show them who's boss. There's another, another uh, perennial to be aware of, and that's mint. Not only mint, but you've got other perennial herbs as well. You've got your sage, your oregano, your, uh, you know, a lot of them, uh, uh, thyme, et cetera. It's a, they're delightful, aromatic, very hearty herbs, but if you grow them directly in your a bed, you're going to have a bed full of mint because it's uh, it's very prolific, they're very tiny seed. So you don't see them propagating new plants via seed. However, they certainly run under the ground and, and they pop up like a whack-a-mole and you'll see them all over the bed. Very hard to, to cut them back because the roots are growing deep into the ground. So talk about allocating room for your perennials. Most uh, uh, invasive, hardy perennial, most perennial herbs I grow in containers. They have beautiful containers. You know, now they have uh, uh, whiskey barrels. They look like whiskey barrels, but actually a lot of them are resin now. Very pretty. You know, they don't dry out as much as the old clay terracotta pots or what have you. So you can look at those. They have them pretty cheaply too at like job lot and places like that, Home Depot, online at Amazon. So I, I contain my, my herbs because if you don't, they'll take over your garden. So make sure you have enough room for your perennials, but, but keep them in line. How about reseeders? Okay, onions. Onions, um, 
you know, once an onion goes to, to seed, uh, you know, if you leave it out there long enough, sometimes it takes a second year, you see a beautiful round flower on top. They actually have flowering alliums uh, that, that don't produce an onion, but it's in, they're in the allium family. They're beautiful and they, 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 don't, pro they don't propagate uh, heavily under the ground. It's just that all those seeds, they're good sized seeds, they'll blow all over the place. So you'll see onions growing where you didn't plant them. Say, what the heck is this onion doing? These are reseeders. They're volunteers. They, they gladly come up. So you dig them up and put them in a pot, give them away or plant them where you want them, or they'll really make a mess out of things. At least when you grow a Jerusalem artichoke, you know it's going to grow up in this, grow in the same patch or a strawberry, but onions, the wind will take the seed and they'll grow, you know, they'll grow, uh, 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 probably, you know, 30 feet away. So also uh, tomato plants, you'll see tomato plants. Some people see squash plants too, but you do see tomato plants that grow from seed. No matter how hard you try, you know, one would fall on the ground. You don't, you don't notice it and it, it goes into the earth. Um, but typically what happens to those tomato plants is they come up late by the time the soil here in Massachusetts warms up. Uh, enough for the tomato to seed to germinate. It doesn't usually have a time, enough time to, to go to fruit. So if you do have a lot of reseeders, they're probably not good uh, unless you have a warm spot or can keep them in a greenhouse or pot them or take extra special care. Uh, but sometimes they are a nuisance. You'll get quite a few. Also, I want to tell you about my favorite reseeder. One year I was in the seed of the month club. I got a bunch of stuff. I had no idea what it is, but, but it was a surprise, like Christmas every month. And one of those was borage. It's a lovely, large flowering uh, uh, plant. The leaves are fuzzy, but they taste like cucumber. And you can use them like, a, I forget what they call that, uh, enchilada. Well, well, you take the, the leaves and you, and you wrap meat or, or fish or some kind of stuffing in them and steam them. Uh, the, the leaves taste like cucumber and it has beautiful uh, flowers, purplish blue flowers that entice all the, the butterflies and the bees to your garden, which is exactly what you want. Then they're so big, you'd think, my God, that must be a perennial plant, but it's not. But it's the hardiest self-seeder you've ever seen in your life. I'm telling you, they grow all over. Uh, so you got to dig them up, give them away. People will love them. People will buy them from you. Um, you know, you, but, you, but, but, you know, they're so huge. You really don't have uh, room for all those uh, volunteers that come up, but it's a beautiful plant. Eat the flowers, eat the leaves um, and still have plenty, plenty to share with your neighbors. And there's a cut, there's another picture. I had to do a close up because it's just such a pretty plant, isn't it? With those edible, beautiful purple flowers. And like I say, my, uh, my humble bumbles uh, think so as well, so. I bought it, I bought it, I think seven, eight years ago and planted it once and, and haven't planted it again. Uh, and it just keeps coming up via reseeding. So let's talk about maximizing your output. If you're like me, especially in these days of inflation, you wanna get the most out of your buck. I was just talking to my friend uh, uh, Rose today and talking about grown perennials and all that and trying to you know, trying to get some good life out of your, out of your stuff. And, um, you know, let's talk about broccoli. Broccoli is a, a, a pretty easy to grow. And, but understand the way the broccoli is, the, the kind that you buy, not the kind you buy in the store, necessarily the kinds you, the kind of crops basically that you grow in your garden are not necessarily the ones they sell in the store. The ones they sell in the store have an extra long lifespan an extra thick skin so that they can be transported from Lord knows where they're grown. Uh, plants look quite different when you grow them yourself. So broccoli, when you grow it, it's probably two and a half to three feet tall. And it has a central head of broccoli. Once you cut that head, by all means, please don't, don't destroy the plant because you'll get several uh, child sh shoots that come out the side of the plant. So you get a ton more broccoli, cut those off and you'll get more broccoli shoots that, that grow out of the side of the plant, side shoots, they call them. So, so be aware when you plant, plant broccoli, you'll have it around for a while. Kale, 
when you, and I hope you like these greens because they're the health, healthiest, healthiest foods out there. And for people that don't like greens, um, you can take them, a kale or broccoli, put them in your, uh, your, your blender with some, some of your berries, your strawberries, blueberries, or what have you. You might want to put in a little bit of uh, yogurt or some protein powder, and it's delicious. I swear it doesn't taste like funk, like, you know, uh, sulfur, like the kale you buy in the store. The reason that stuff in the store smells and tastes like penicillin is because it's probably old. Because it has a, once you cut it, it, you know, it lasts a long time. But when you pick it, garden to plate, garden to plate, that's the way you should be doing it. It'll last a good long time. And kale, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It comes up, you pick the leaves on the outside, and it continues to grow on the inside. One kale plant, once it takes off, it'll grow for months. So keep that in mind. Peas and beans. Every week, keep stick a couple of new ones in there so they don't all come up at once. You don't want that. Well, canning's okay, but you, you, like I say, you, 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 you are going to, you know, hopefully you grow enough so that you will have some canning, freezing, and dehydrating to do at the end of the season. However, what you really want to do is make sure you can go out and pick, you know, you, this is your grocery store. So keep, keep that in mind. So plant peas and beans, stick a couple of new ones in every week to enhance your harvest. And if you have, um, if you have, you know, one kind of bean, the, the, the green beans, maybe you want to put some, some purple string beans in there or some yellow ones, mix it up. They don't cross pollinate. It's not an issue for beans and peas. So, uh, so ha have fun with it as well. Maximize your output. Talk about radish. Rad, I don't, I don't particularly like radish, um, but boy, if I was in the business of selling vegetables here at the farmer's market, I would get radish because radish can go from seed to, to harvest in three weeks. So plant it off and plant different kinds. They have red globes, white globes. They have long, long cylindrical uh, French radish. Uh, they've got daikon, which is a radish product that looks like a carrot, only it's white. Sometimes it's purple. So anyway, mix them up and um, and, and and harvest harvest frequently every 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 three weeks. Also, wherever you put your radish in, understand that it's going to aerate the soil, so it's actually a good companion plant for other plants. Oops. Okay. So lettuce, just like the kale, pick the lettuce from the, you don't ever, there's never a reason why I'm going to chop off a, a lettuce, a whole plant, because you'll, you'll kill the plant. You know, plants need some amount of photo, the sun and the leaf in order to, to live. So what you do, like I say, you want to plant a bunch of lettuces, plant some different kinds, plant some romaine, plant some black seeded Simpson plant some butter crunch, and then go out there and pick from the outside, they'll continue to grow on the inside. So you can, you know, enjoy it. And, and, um, and you'll, and, and, you know, talk about lettuce. What, just FYI, one lettuce, package of lettuce seeds, probably 300 seeds in it. So you'll, you'll, and they last five years. So you believe me, uh, if you like lettuce, you'll have plenty in it'll, it'll last you a good while. And besides, you know, lettuce is one of those spring crops. Uh, the, I should say cool weather crops. It likes it in the spring. It likes it in the in the uh, fall. However, in the summer, it can bolt to seed. It dies. You know, it gets too hot and it says, "Oh, geez, I'm going to die. I need to I need to produce seed in order to preserve the the species." So so it does. And you don't want to only plant one type because then it'll all bolt to seed at the same time, and you want to have a steady supply. So plant different lettuces, and when you harvest them, harvest them from the outside. I know I'm going over this fast. You have questions, put them in the chat, and uh, and we'll we'll get to them. I I promise. So we'll talk about tomatoes. Everyone that does tomato, you know, grows tomatoes. It's a little bit of an effort. Typically, you don't grow them by by seed. 
outdoors. You have to start them in, inside under lights. Um, but but it, with, with tomatoes, you see they have a lot of unproductive smaller limbs, typically. Typically the big ones, you know, the big plants, not the little dwarf ones that you get in the pot. But you can pinch those off, you know, in order, in order you know, you can get three, four times the amount of tomatoes by, by uh, pinching off all the unproductive, they call them suckers. Remove those from your tomato plants and you'll get much more fruit from it. Uh, you don't, like I say, you don't have to do it in the, in the dwarfs. It won't be of much benefit, but uh, a plant does not multitask well. So when the plant is struggling to grow up and grow stems and grow, you know, tall and would have grow root, it's not, it's, it's not concentrating on growing fruit. So that's why we remove the, the temptation for it to grow the green and it'll concentrate more on producing fruit. Also, uh, cucumbers to get to maximize your, your, your cucumber. I have cucumber vines out here. Uh, they were, uh, so understand, you know, obviously several different types of cucumbers, right? Um, if you're in a small family and you want to do the, the whole farm to table, garden to plate, you may not want to grow the big, long English cukes, uh, burpless, you know, the, top, the long ones that cost you a dollar fifty in the even in market basket, because you may have to you put them in the refrigerator. They get soft within a matter of days. If you're from a with a small family, you'll want to grow the pickling cubes because one of them you know will be a meal for the for one or two people. It'll that's all you need for a salad. And pickling cubes are called pickling cubes because they do well in pickles, not because you have to pickle them, because they taste just as good as any other. So my, my tip on pickles is um, if you're in a small family, you grow the smaller varieties. And also a lot of times the vine can take, you have a lot of nitrogen in your soil and the vines just want to take off. So they, they just take off and they don't produce a lot of fruit. So what you do to stop that is once the vine gets three or four feet long, you, you uh, pinch off the tip of your uh, tomato, uh, excuse me, your cucumber plant. And that stunts the vine and forces it to, to produce more flowers and consequently produce more fruit. So you can, you can do that as well. So maximize your output. Here is, uh, and this is, this is a little cheat sheet. As I say, if you're in 5B in Long Meadow, it's basically the same within a day or two, I'm sure. Um, but this is, uh, here's the legend up here. You start the seeds indoors. It's, it's heading into March. So we should be starting our broccoli indoors, cauliflower indoors, spinach indoors. And then uh, middle, uh, so that's early March, middle of March, your beets, kale, uh, lettuce, onions, peas. So it'll tell you what to start when within your zone. So understand that when you're, you know, when you're making, your, your plants uh, for your garden, understand what's going to come out when. So you can space everything. So, you know, I've been fascinated. I, I, it, within, within, in my town, they, they did a, a, the historical society, I think they call it. They did a presentation with uh, an American Indian from the Nipmuc Nation, which actually still is still in existence, although in the history books they were written off. Um, you know, they did a, a, a one of the one of them actually came and talked a little bit about the way they lived, but but not enough to satisfy my my curiosity. So, but uh, in any case, one of this, the uh, techniques that our Native Americans uh, use in gardening is the Three Sisters method. They have fables about it and all that. You can, you can do some, some Google search on it. Um, but the Three Sisters Gardening Method includes growing corn, beans, and squash. When I say squash, I'm talking about viney squash, not the bush varieties like the zucchini and summer squash and all that. So um, let me tell you what, how they did it. Basically, they grew corn. Corn, if, whether you know it or not, is is a North American uh, cultivar. Like I say, there are very few of them. 
It's a North American cultivar and it, and, it, and it started as a grass and it was hybridized by our American, American uh, Native Americans and, and finally came to corn, which is used throughout the world. They say 70% of the uh, crops out there actually originated and were hybridized by the, the Native Americans. I don't mean just in the US, I mean throughout the Americas, interestingly enough. So anyway, the corn grows, okay? And it's nice and sturdy. And um, then uh, the, the beans grow because night, excuse me, corn needs a lot of nitrogen in order, in order because it produces these big ears. It needs a lot of that specific macronutrient nitrogen in order to grow. Well, beans also have some requirements for life, right? They're kind of floppy and viney and they need to wrap around something in order to grow. So they, they, they uh, help, they, uh, the corn helps them out and, and lets them wrap around the, the corn in order to grow. But the, the, the beans also deposit nitrogen in the soil. So it's a, it's a match made in heaven, right? The beans feed the corn nitrogen, which they need, and the corn allows the beans to, the bean uh, stalks to, to wrap around the, the corn stalks in order, in order to live. So it's, it's perfect. And then there's the squash. What happens with the squash, the squash, these are viney squash, as I say, they, you, you train them to rest along the bottom of the garden bed. And squash has big leaves and the leaves keep the soil moist because, you know, obviously the sun, the, the, so, the water and the soil won't evaporate because of the big, big leaves. It also, it prevents weeds and it insulates the soil. So that's the three sisters method uh, that still people use today. I have a lot of friends that, that use the three sisters method uh, today. Best to use the the old uh, the maize the old uh, the the hard Indian corn they call it. Uh, so you you'll play around with it a little bit. Um, it you know uh, so and, and good luck with it. Some people have good luck, some people don't. You may have to try a couple of different cultivars, but but uh, definitely worth looking into. Oops. Okay. All right. So this is. See, that's not working right. Bear with me here. The heck? Okay. Yep. Okay. So the square foot gardening guide. This is not a blueprint of a garden. This is just a guide. So the square foot gardening method is something that people do uh, when they have a limited amount of space. It's a, you really need to have some decent, fertile soil in order to accommodate one plant every square foot. You also have to prune them very carefully to, to grow upward or you're gonna, you know, something's gonna topple over and something's gonna get in the way of another plant. You also have to arrange your lighting in your sun source, understanding that this, the Southern exposure is the most, uh, the Southern exposure is the most consistent in your early days of the early season, um, in the spring, your, your uh, longest sun comes from the east. However, in the hot heat of the summer, your longest sun comes in the west. So keep, keep that in mind uh, when, you, when you're doing this bit with me here. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this is what this guide is telling you. If you so let me let me back up a little. People may have never even heard of this. So what you do is you take a raised bed, and a raised bed, say it's four, four feet by eight feet or what have you. Every foot, every square foot, you cordon that off with some type of a uh, a twine, gardening twine. And uh, so you have all these one foot measurements, and in those one foot measurements, you 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 plant. What do you plant? Well, this will tell you, you can plant, let's skip around. You can plant 11 arugula seeds. You can plant 16 carrots. You can 
plant, nine onions, nine onion, uh, uh, onion plants. You can plant one Brussels sprout, Lord knows they're big, one hot pepper. They say sweet potatoes, I don't know. Um, one tomato, hopefully a smaller version of a tomato. One pumpkin, you know, you, it's, it's got a vine. One pepper, so these are basically, um, a lot of people are doing this, and this is just a guide to tell you how many of each of these plants that you can plant in one square foot. As I say, it takes a lot of work. You gotta have the right sun. You have to arrange it uh, very well before you plant. And um, if you have any questions about it, I can refer you to some links. Um, I actually have a gentleman that's in my Facebook group uh, that wrote a book on it, so. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this square foot method that everybody's uh, doing these days. It's only been around, you know, like I say, the Three Sisters Garden's been around for since the 1600, before the 1600s. Um, and the square foot method, I would think under 50 years anyway. So the pros are, it's good for kids. You know, my granddaughter's been gardening with me since she was two, so never too young. Uh, they see a variety of crops in a small area. It's great for people who have limited space, but have maybe a lot of time on their hands to prune and, and trellis and all that. It's a great way to produce a lot of plants, uh, a wide variety of different plants. It's easy. It's pretty easy to, to create. And... Um, it's a small area that you can actually fence around to keep out pests. That says test, but I mean, it means pests. Sorry, but I got to fix that typo. Um, but it, you, so, so it's, it's not much to fence around. Fences are expensive. The cons are once you get some weeds in there, difficult to manage. I would make sure that I put some decent mulch on top of it. Um, insects, once you get an insect, if you're not on top of it, um, you can get a pretty bad insect infestation, which is going to be pretty difficult to treat in a, in a garden that's that dense. And if left without pruning, you're, you're going to have an issue with, uh, with your tomatoes and other viney crops taken over. You'll also you need to take more careful planting of the sun and the, and the rain. You, know, you need some amount of space in there or you may get a, have a mold problem. Also, your soil will need to be very rich to accommodate such volume. You know, I'm an organic gardener and, and I don't use uh, a lot of, well, I, I use mild fertilizers, organic fertilizers. You may not have an organic, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, you, may, you, you may not even need uh, fertilizers if your soil's good enough. And that's why I, in order to, uh, to manage my soil, what organic gardens is, is they use compost and they add good compost to their soil on a, on a, uh, on a yearly basis. So you need some good soil. So I would assume if you did the square foot method, you would want a fairly high bed to accommodate quite a bit of uh, compost material. So let's talk about herbs. I'm a big proponent of herbs. I have, you know, last year I grew, grew quite a few for clients, gave quite a few away at the end of the season. And I dehydrated a whole bunch to, to give to friends and family. Plus, I still have some to actually use, use for myself. I'm talking about sage, thyme, lemon balm, mint, spearmint, chives. There's two kinds of chives, regular chives and garlic chives. I have them all. Celery. Celery actually grows as an herb, by the way. Uh, so it's a kin, a cousin to, to parsley. In parsley, many different kinds of basil, etc. So herbs make your food taste awesome. And when grown around the perimeter of your garden, uh, they can actually deter your pests. Believe it or not. What ha and in your critters. So what happens is uh, they're so stinky smelly you know that the uh the they say the groundhogs i don't know that they're pretty smart but the, some of the critters and some of the pests that they, they have such a, a strong scent that um 
you know, they won't even, you know, around, uh, around the, uh, the herbs. So definitely grow them around the perimeter of your garden to deter your pests or your critters. So like anything else, these are different life, you know, each, each plant has a different life cycle. Each plant has different properties. And as you know, you know, talking about herbs, I do a class in herbs, uh, growing herbs and harvesting herbs. I don't do one in the medicinal because I'm not an herb, herbalist and I would just hate to give somebody bad information about their health. So I, I don't, but, um, but you know, there are certainly, uh, this was nature's uh, pharmacy long before big pharma came in and, uh, and stopped that. But, uh, but herbs also deter pests. And, and this, is, this is a chart, we'll, we'll, we'll go over some. Um, basil, grow, it might be a good idea to, to grow it next to your carrots because you can see that basil deters the carrot fly, which is a pest that's, that the carrots are prone to. It also uh, deters asparagus beetles, so, so grow it near your asparagus. Borage, that beautiful plant I showed you, and I made a special point to have a, a special slide that showed it close up. That repels the notorious tomato hornworm. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they grow four inches long, and they're probably as thick around as, uh, as a nickel in their, in their uh, bright green, uh, and uh, they will decimate your, your crops. Uh, from you know they'll they'll eat the leaf and the stem and everything they will do a number on your tomatoes on your peppers on your uh, tomatillos on your uh, ground cherries uh, basically on your nightshade family so borage in in and then you gotta you gotta take them and remove them and you know i i hate to kill them but they say it's more humane to kill them because if you move them far away from any nightshades, they're going to die anyway. And also borage, uh, borage is a good pest that deters cabbage worm. Cabbage worm is, is notorious. What the mother does is she flies over all your brassica plants. I'm talking about, let me give you, let me tell you what I'm talking about. I was talking to Rose today, a kohlrabi, rutabaga, turnip, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, broccoli, cabbage. So all of that's all in the, the family. And what, what, she, what the, she does is she flies over it, uh, drops her seed, her, excuse me, her uh, eggs. And then, you know, the, the cabbage, will, the leaves will keep developing and they'll keep growing over the eggs, the eggs will hatch and they'll be having a field day munching on the inside of your cabbage. And then when you go to harvest your cabbage, you'll see it's pretty much rotted and hollow on the inside. So you need all the help you can get. So definitely grow borage around your brassica plants. And if you have any problems with any other problems with cabbage worms, let me know. I have a few tricks in my arsenal because of personal experience, believe me. Catnip, um, cats love it. Uh, repels ants, flea beetle, aphids, Japanese beetles, squash bugs, weevils, nasty, nasty Colorado potato beetle, cabbage lopper, cockroach. And obviously it may attract cats, something you really don't want in your garden. You don't want cats to, to uh, you know, leave their, do their business in the garden. They don't eat the crops, but if, you know, the, the, uh, the cat, feces is, uh, has a bacteria in it that's not good for your plants. Chamomile, lovely, lovely tea out of chamomile. It also repel, repels a plethora of flying insects. So definitely grow chamomile. Unusual, uh, we, we call it an herb. Basically an herb is something where you, where the leaf is aromatic. In the chamomile, it's a very relaxing tea you make, but you don't usually make it out of the, uh, out of the leaf, you make it out of the flower, you pop it right off. So chives, chives is an allium. It's in the uh, onion and garlic family. 
It repels parrot fly, Japanese beetle, and aphids, and probably even more. Basically, if you're going to grow one type of plant in companion style uh, to deter pests, you'll want to grow things like chives or onions because they're stinky. I love them. I think I, I love this, the smell, but the pests, as I say, they can't smell the food beyond the chives and the onions and the garlic, and they don't like them. So they're very good companions. Coriander uh, repels aphids, that Colorado potato beetle and spider mites. I want to tell you a story, you know, talking about companions. I want to tell you a story about the Colorado potato beetle. Um, I had it. I buy very good seed potatoes. I love potatoes. We had a, 20, a 25 foot bed, I think it's around three feet wide with nothing but different purple potatoes, fingerlings, russets, you name it. And the Colorado potato beetle started to, to plague my, my potato plants. However, they didn't do much damage because you know they munched on a leaf now and again, but they didn't really do much damage. You know, the, the potatoes growing underground anyway, and I don't like to treat anything if I don't have to. So I kind of let it go. And then I realized that those Colorado potato beetles were doing a number on my eggplant. They were doing a number on my peppers, on my, uh, my tomatillos and on my ground cherries. Why you might, you might ask? because those plants are all in the nightshade family. They're all in the same family, potato and pepper and eggplant and uh, uh, pepper, eggplant, all those, they're all in the same family. And the Colorado potato beetle lives on the potatoes, but it finds the more tender plants such as the tomato and the pepper, easy prey. So it'll completely devastate them. So in any case, coriander, otherwise known as cilantro, is a good companion. And because you have these companions, doesn't mean that you're not going to have to spray with an organic solution. There are organic solutions that you can use. And I, I'm giving you this, this heads up because there are a lot of them that use the newer technology um, that they use biologics uh, instead of using chemicals. So I have a special a uh, jar, a uh, bottle that I get of this, uh, uh, this uh, liquid that I put in my, in my sprayer that all it does is kill the Colorado potato beetles. That's, that's it. And it does a real, real good job of it because any herbs I have in the world in that area weren't going to do it. Once you're infested, you're infested. The thing is, you know, do your companion planting at the beginning of the season if you still have issues, don't rely on it. You know, you get it. Sometimes you get to take matters into your own hands. I have another presentation called the organic approach, which gives you a lot of different remedies, you know, different insecticidal soaps and all that kind of stuff that you can use when, when you have to. That's a tool in your tool belt, you know, in your arsenal and you use them when, when you have to. So it's important, you know, uh, you see a lot of green, green people in, in, you know, I'm, I'm one of them as well. I don't like to use any chemicals or anything. Um, but, you know, if you, sometimes if you let nature do her thing, she's, gonna, she's going to give more uh, power to the insects than, than to us. So you have to, you have to be mindful. Uh, dill, dill repels aphids, squash bugs, spider mites. Again, the nasty cabbage loafer and the uh, small white. Fennel, laven uh, aphids, lavender repels moths, scorpions, we have to worry about that. Mosquitoes in the leak repels carrot fly. So that's just a few. Uh, we have more here. Uh, just to give you a heads up, I love growing different funky, I like growing funky things in my garden. You know, I'm, uh, I, I like to get, get wild with my, with my herbs and one really, really good way you can do it is by growing like I, I have sage is a very savory plant you know sage is sage is what you put in stuffing to give it that 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 flavor um, however I grow pineapple sage tastes nothing like it nice and sweet and also this you see a lot of uh, plants around that have lemon or lime in the name so you have lemon balm lemon thyme 
uh, lime, basil, uh, anything you have with the citrus in it, uh, it actually ha ha contains the chemical citronella, which as you know, they put in uh, candles that to, to, to uh, deter the pests, the mosquitoes. You know, those candles, you, you get to buy them in the three pack and put them out on your deck or you take them camping or whatever. So definitely grow the, uh, the plants that have a citrus scent to them. Um, oregano, oregano is great. It repels too many pests to, to mention. Parsley, asparagus beetles, peppermint, you'll see the cabbage loafer, aphids, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, thyme, you'll see, this, there's just so many, so many to mention. So definitely do that. Now we'll talk about planting your garden. Now, let, before we do that, I just want to give you a, a, a tip. And um, you don't usually, I, I did this in order to arrange a, a, a planting. I believe all of these, the vast majority of these are probably summer plants that I plant in the second week of May. However, uh, just to give you a heads up, you can multi-purpose your beds. Uh, what am I trying to say? So, so garlic. Garlic you plant in October and you harvest it in, in July. In July, you know, we already went over, you, you can still plant stuff in July. You can plant more peas, more beans. You can plant lettuce, all those plant, radish has a three week, you know, growing cycle. So just make sure you use up all your space and, and have the timing down. So this is when I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beds. I now have um, 10, just got my 10th bed. So the reason I put it in here is I'm a, I'm a computer geek, computer user. I've been using computers since the day, day one. Uh, you know, I mean, I was in, in work for technology companies back in the, in the 1970s before practically probably have anyone if you were, were even born, but uh, so I've, I, I use a lot of applications. I find it easier. So I do this. And, you know, I have a Facebook group that has about 70,000. Uh, well, I think maybe 68,000. So, so close to 70 um, users in it. And I put the question now, hey, what do you use, you know, to design your garden? Do you use Excel? Do you use an online? You know, there's a lot of tools you can get. And a lot of people, believe it or not, not just the oldies like myself, a lot of people use pencil and paper in the old graph paper that you get. I don't even know where you can buy it. They don't even, probably in Staples or something, but regular graph, you know, graph paper, you can chart out your, your, uh, uh, your uh, square for gardening or what have you. And then you don't, you find something you don't like in there, you want to move it around, you just erase it and start again. So two different strokes for different folks. I like to keep these when I design my garden because Every year I rotate and that's, you know, because like this year I had the tomatoes over here uh, growing and tomatoes are, you know, they suck a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So the, the next year I may plant them over here where I had my beans planted because as you know, beans actually deposit nitrogen in the soil. So be aware of that um, and, and make sure to rotate uh, your, your crops whenever you can. So I wanna give you, uh, this is a, I, I stole this from one of my other uh, presentations, but this is a garden planning, just, just to, to make you aware, okay? This is from a class that I have on growing a, growing a summer salad. And uh, I just want to tell you, uh, you know that sun, the, the southern exposure is the most consistent light. And as I say, the spring light is over here, comes, is longer in the, in the spring in the, from the east in the, and in the summer, it's, it's, it's better in the, in the west. So uh, we do know one thing, tomatoes and cucumbers really like the sun. And they grow all season. Basically, you plant them in May and they're going to 
you know, they're going to be with you for months to come. So what I do is um, I plant them next to the southern exposure. So they'll get a hefty amount of sun, consistent sun. And then as we know, lettuce doesn't like the sun. It'll bolt to seed. It has a short life. That's why you have to plant different kinds and all that. So what I do is I plant that closest over here, the lettuce to my northern exposure so that it will be a little bit more shaded. It won't get the direct sun. So that's just a simple garden plant. Keep these things in mind. I know you might have been you might have been expecting to, to come to this presentation and get a real, real clear indication on how to build your garden. And what I do basically in my classes, we're all smart people, and people have been gardening since since they stopped foraging thousands of years ago. So I don't tell you how to garden. I just give people a lot of tips and a lot of ideas and a lot of tools. And then if you have any questions, I am always open to questions. I probably get I don't know, maybe 20 a week anyway. So uh, 21 won't be so bad. So if you have any questions, let me know. It's in, how do I learn them? I learn them from copious amounts of reading, studying books, uh, uh, social media, and from you, you know, from users in, in, uh, in these presentations that, that want to share. So um, just to let you also know that there are some commercially available garden planners that you can download uh, or use on your, on your laptop or on your phone. And they're kind of cool if you can see it. Like for this, this one example, you'll see some lettuce and you can, you can uh, draw, uh, drag and drop it right onto your garden wherever you, wherever you want it. So there are a number of different commercially available garden planners. As I say, some of them, Basically, the ones you download, you may have to pay for, uh, but there are several of them you pay a, a subscription and you can get them available on the web. Sometimes you'll get them for free, but perhaps the tool isn't quite as robust as the paid, the paid version, but you definitely may want to um, check something like that out if it's more your speed. Like I said, I like technology, but I'm fine using my old Excel. My days as an accountant, I guess I'm used to the tool. So, so this is this is a, a, a very interesting slide. And this tells you, as you can see up here, it tells you um, the the plants. Uh, the 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 legend will tell you uh, those in the the dark bluish green. The plants that grow well together. Then. Um, See if I can pull this out of the way. I can't. Okay. Then uh, the the uh, medium green benefits to gardens in general. Uh, the brown is co combination helps bug control. Uh, the uh, orange is the carrots will have good flavor but stunted roots. And then the red is a red flag that says don't plant these together. And as you can see, there are people that do this, and this is like a science. Do I know every reason these are out here? I do know this. I do know a lot of them, and, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you about a couple of them. However, some of them are a chemical thing. You know, there's you know, chemicals emitted by the roots of the bean doesn't, the, the, uh, the pepper doesn't like it. You know, there may be some, and they call that allopathic effect, and, and that's prevalent in some of these. And I don't know all the reasons, uh, but, Good rule of thumb is keep them as far as apart as you can if, if you see the red, the red flags. So let's just talk about a couple of them here. Um, uh, let's pick a couple that I might know of. Here's a good one down here, sunflowers. Sunflowers grow well with corn. They grow well with melon. So actually they could grow in the Three Sisters garden, right? Nothing about the beans, but that's okay. And then sage and thyme are beneficial to your garden in general. So uh, let's look at peppers. Peppers grow well with basil, carrots, cucumber. They really grow well. Uh, oregano, parsley, peas, rosemary, squash, Swiss chard, tomatoes. Sage and thyme 
are good for the garden in general. And then you don't grow them with beans, broccoli, or cauliflower. I'm not sure of the reason why, but I think it could be one of a, a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, beans, as you know, deposit nitrogen in the soil. And when peppers have too much nitrogen, they want to grow. I'm talking they want to go green. They'll gladly go green. They'll grow, 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 grow like a big old bush. And they won't produce any fruit because they don't multitask well. So if you have too much nitrogen in the soil, your peppers are not going to bear fruit. Uh, same way your broccoli and your cauliflower, in order to get them to grow, you have to add a lot of compost. You have to add, you know, make sure they have a lot of nitrogen. And while you're feeding your broccoli and your cauliflower, your peppers are saying, okay, I don't want to produce peppers. So that's just an example. I'll give you another one. Um, you know, some of them I don't know, but they follow along the right lines. Like for example, you see garlic out here. Garlic grows well with broccoli, cauliflower, lettuce, strawberry, and tomatoes. Sage and thyme are good with just about anything, but they don't grow well with beans and peas. That may be what's known as the allopathic effect, meaning that it's a chemical reaction, but it's logical that they wouldn't grow well with uh, peas or beans because they're both, as you probably know, or maybe not, they're in the same family. Those are peas and beans are both in the legume family. So you can always follow this chart. You know, um, you don't really need to know every reason behind it, but I think it's interesting. And just so you realize I didn't just throw it up here. Um, you know, there really is some, some good meat behind it. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is interesting here. Um, down here, corn, see the corn? Corn grows well with a bunch of stuff. Obviously we know it grows well with the beans. That's part of the three sisters. Cucumber, dill, melon, parsley, peas, squash, sunflower. It, these two are just good with everything, but it doesn't grow well with tomatoes. I think I might know why, because corn, requires a ton of nitrogen because nitrogen is gonna, gonna help it produce those, you know, grow. It's a very tall plant. Some corn can grow to eight feet tall. And tomatoes as well. The indeterminate tomatoes can also grow to seven, seven eight feet tall. So uh, you, you really need to specially fortify any soil that's gonna have enough nutrients to, uh, to have both the corn and the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the tomatoes. So, so anyway, that's a, that's a good reference material. And this is why I wanted you to send me that, that email. I'll, I'll flash it in the end so that you can, uh, you know, you can get this, this, uh, these references. So that is the presentation we have here for you folks. That's a lot of stuff. So do we have any questions, uh, Lindsay? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or you could unmute um, yourself and, and ask a question. We have a few minutes for questions. I am going to, since I'm here, I may as well uh, see here. Oh. I'm going to put my email back again in the chat. So, okay, um, I'll, I'll take that email. Um, okay, let's we get some questions in there. BV Veggie Gardens at oops at gmail.com. BV Veggie Gardens. That's my email. Um, Lindsay, I can read these, okay? Okay. Um, any herbs you recommend for deterring rabbits? Um, there are some marigolds in theory deter, deter rabbits. So you might, and that's a flower, you might wanna do that. You may wanna try your mints and you may wanna try some chives and good luck. Uh, sometimes they just trudge on even though you, you plant the appropriate deterrent, 
So what you may have to do with uh, rabbits is you may have to put a fence in, which isn't too daunting for rabbits. You put a two and a half foot fence in. They're little hoppers, but they can't hop over two and a half feet. And they do a lot of damage in the garden, a lot of damage to the green. They'll even, you know, pull the carrots, carrots right out of the ground. So, uh, so if it's a two and a half feet, it's it's not not uh, Im impossible to do. Uh, so, let's see what else do we have? I just popped in there um, in April. We have another program scheduled with you, the backyard orchard. If people want to register ahead of time, I I popped the link in there. Oh, great. Okay, any other questions we have? We used to have a little bit of time. Let's just see, do we have any other questions? Okay. I guess not. Okay. So just to tell you a little bit about what's coming up here uh, at the stores library, we're going to do the backyard orchard. So don't get intimidated by that. Um, you don't have to have food trees. You can, you know, it's all about uh, fruit trees, but also bushes, raspberry bushes, uh, blueberries, uh, you know, uh, blackberries. And um, so, yeah, and how to take care of them so they'll you know, continue how to how to deter the pests, how to plant them, you know, how to harvest them. Also, it's also trees as well, you know, apple trees, peach trees, uh, uh, cherry trees, all that. So, uh, so th those are great sources of perennial food. You know, you they, they'll outlive you probably, you know, if you treat them well. So are there any other questions, uh, Lindsay? Yeah, we had a couple pop in the chat just now. Oh, um, somebody wanted to know where to get the recording and the slides. Um, Kate shared her email address. You can email her for the slides. Um, the recording will be on the Stores Library YouTube page, and I will email that out to all the people who registered um, to the program tonight. Yeah, please send me an email. I'll definitely get you the in, um, the the slides. And Lindsay, I'll send you a copy. I'll send you a copy as well Wait. if you want to. If and I can, send I can email that out to all the registrants that way. That would be yeah, great. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Any other questions? There is one more. Do you think it's helpful to plant flowers around a raised bed garden of veggies? I do. There are certain uh, veggies that, uh, certain flowers that are known to have wonderful effects as pest and critter deterrents. And those are uh, nasturtium and marigold. Both of them, if you're going to start them, you can buy them. But if you're going to start them from seed, you should start them now. There's some special things you have to do. You know, they need the seeds need to be kept in a cold uh, place. So you got to keep them in the in the fridge for a while. And, um, you know, you can start both of those indoors. I believe the nasturtiums are supposed to be uh, scarified. But anyway, read up on those or you can buy them. But definitely marigolds and nasturtiums are too. Um, uh, two of them, they're very attractive flowers as well. Not only will they bring in, uh, will they deter, uh, you know, critters and pests, but they'll also uh, bring in the pollinators, which is good, so. All right, well, Kate, thank you so much. This has been really informative and we have a lot of people saying thank you in the chat. So I think oh, it's great. Been really useful and great information for everyone. Thank you. Great, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much for coming. Happy gardening. Bye-bye. Thank you.